Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and tonight I am going to share with you an interview with Father Brian Gowans. Father Brian was the assistant priest at St Francis Xavier's Catholic Church in Falkirk for three years in the 1990s. During that period he got to know the Mocking family and became friendly with Neely himself. This culminated following the death of Neely Mockin in 1994 with Father Brian doing the honours at Neely Mockin's funeral mass. I interviewed Father Brian within the chapel, so there is a wee echo in both of our voices, but I'm sure you'll still enjoy the discussion. My connection goes back from a wee laddie lying in bed at night in Bowhill before I started going to the games, listening to the fans coming back from Glasgow and listening to their songs. And, of course, a place like Bow Hill has both Celtic and Rangers fans. So there were certain songs I'd hear that I'd like and join in, and there were certain songs I just didn't like to hear. Um, but my recollection of, of Newley prior to coming here would just be about reading about him, you know, but then getting more involved in that history through being here. M- my very early days, actually, I wasn't really keen on football. I was never really into it. It was the songs that I liked and and the fact that all of my family, all my cousins and that were mad keen on this team called Celtic. Um, Later on one of my cousins took me to Parkhead to a game and I can't really remember what age I was then but I was probably even late teens so uh, it would be the late teens really before I, I got involved and from my first game, that was me. I was, I was just hooked. Um, I did a lot of work as a priest in England, um, so I didn't get the opportunity to go to many games, uh, but kept involved with them and sold loads of raffle tickets. And, and Nearly everybody I knew and the circle of friends I had were all mad keen on Celtic. So, so Celtic kind of get, get into the blood. And then I came up to, to Falkirk to hear in 1993 Um, and and much to my surprise uh, everybody here was mad keen on Celtic mainly because Neely Moken's sister Nan was the housekeeper here Um, and the first question I was asked on arrival here is what colour would you like your room to which I replied any colour as long as it's green and of course that got a laugh throughout the house and it was duly painted green don't know if it's still green, but it was certainly green all the time I was here. So in my early years, I was mainly listening to family and friends who were mad keen on Celtic, but I didn't really get the opportunity to go to games till I was in my late teens, and then there was a spell when I didn't really get very often, except on holidays, because I was working in England. But from 1993 to today, I've had a season ticket, and uh, I go as often as I can. In fact, I get very annoyed when I can't go. Before speaking about the, the Mocking family and your connection with them, Brian, could you tell us your all-time favourite memory of being a Celtic fan? What was the greatest time as, as a Celtic fan for you? Of being a Celtic fan? I would really like to say every game, but obviously there are some games that are better than others. Um, my favourite player to, to watch um, has to be Henrik Larsson. Now, I know people will talk about Jimmy Johnson and all the rest, and they were, ter- you know, lots of people of Jimmy Zilk and that whole 67 team. They're terrific players, but I never saw them play. Um, I've met them often enough, but I never actually saw them play. Um, so in terms of watching players, um, it would have to be Henrik Larsson. I do have a soft spot, though, for folk like Lubo Moravchik and Stan Petrov. Um, you know, that team, when they played, I wish they were still playing today, to be honest. No disrespect to the current team, but they have lots of memories. And I remember one goal in particular that Henrik scored, and it was a free kick, and the ball was placed almost on the corner spot. It was like he was taking a corner, and how he managed to get that ball in the net from there, I don't know, but he did. And I can still picture that goal today. So, yeah, he, watching that team... You know, when Henrik was playing. I think my favourite season was when Tommy Burns was manager and we didn't actually win anything. Um, and, you know, that was the downside of that particular season. But the football we played that season was terrific. And I, I would watch that football all day. Sad to say we didn't win, but it was terrific football to watch. 
Now you have a, a very special connection with the Mocken family. Could you explain to us how you got to know them as a family? Sure. And how you got to know Neely in particular? Well, I think, as I've already said, my first introduction was through living here and, and Neely's sister being our housekeeper. Um, Nan, in fact, did, did most of the cooking for us and a bit of the cleaning, and she was around the house a lot. And, and through Nan knowing my fondness and likeness for Celtic, she introduced me to Neely, and indeed I got to know the rest of the family through that. Um, I would often see Neely when I was at the games because in those days Neely was still very much on the, uh, you know, part of the team, although he was no longer playing. And Neely would be sitting in the dugout, and my seat looked down on the dugout. So I used to look down and give him a wee wave if he looked up, and um, got to know him a wee bit that way. And then listening to some of the stories, which I'm sure you've heard from the family, you know, obviously you know his nickname was Smiler, and got to know why that came about. Um, got to realise that I would never go in the car with him because none of the family would go in the car with him because allegedly he was not a particularly good driver. Um, there's lots of to- tales the family have told about that, um, but I was never actually in the car with him. Um, and then while I was here, I was also chaplain to the secondary school down the road at St Mungo's and a lot of Neely's family, you know, the grandkids and that, they, they were all there and uh, they would spend a lot of time with me. And again... The connection there would usually be Celtic. I mean, most pupils would talk to me about Celtic rather than any problems they were having or, or any difficulty in school, you know, because they knew um, they'd get a, a good response, a favourable response from me. Um, and occasionally I'd get invited to their houses and would go, and most of the birthday parties, Christmas parties, any kind of party, they'd invite me along and uh, we'd just chew the fat over the games and uh, how things were going. Fantastic. Now, one of the, the big things, obviously, speak through uh, to the family is you get an idea of the personality and the character of Neil Mocken. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the experience you have, how would you describe Neil as a person? As a person, um, he was a terrific family man. Uh, in fact, at, at the funeral, I, I based my homily around the funeral on, on three words. Um, all beginning with the letter F, and when I said that, it did raise a few eyebrows, but the three F words, as I called them, were faith, family, and football. And those three things um, meant, a terrific, meant a terrific deal to, to, to Neely. Um, and I wasn't afraid to put them in that order. I mean, most folk might have thought I would have put family first. But Neely was a great man of faith, and you know he came to church regularly. He prayed a lot, and and he thanked God for his family, and recognised that you know God was very much part of of their life and his life, uh, and so he drew a lot of strength from his faith, and that's why I focused on that first. But then, equally as important, are the fact that he had a good family and he was very supportive of his family, very protective of his family, uh, and. Um, was a great, terrific father and grandfather, you know, and they were very safe and secure uh, with him around, and, you know, a t- terrific family man. And then, of course, th- the third one I mentioned was football, which was his career, and you could tell his, his, his likeness for that never left him. N- nearly never really retired. You know, even up until the day he died, if he could do anything for Celtic, he would have done it, you know. he just It was just in his blood. Um, and so a, a combination of those three, and you need to have a combination of those three really to get to find the true man, and, and the true man isn't in there, you know. Sadly, Neely was struck with illness in, in yeah. 1994, yeah. and obviously with your connection to the family, sure. you were very much involved in yeah. his last days, yeah. if you like. Could you just tell us about finding out about Neely's health and how that culminated in, in you visiting his wife? Sure, that sure. Day? The when the news was broken, obviously it was broken in the house here, and uh, it, it was Nan that told me, and uh, there was a sadness in the house. You know, it really put a downer on things, and um, we were all, you know, we were all sorry to hear. I mean, he was, as, as public knowledge, he was diagnosed with leukemia, uh, and with such a diagnosis, uh, and uh, he wasn't a t- particularly old man, but we all realised, you know, that there was. He, he was never going to recover from this. It was a question of time. But having mentioned, you know, that he was a man of faith and had great family support, 
When I met with Neely, and, and certainly in, in, in our church we have the tradition of the sacrament of the sick, which I did administer to Neely, that there was there was that calm acceptance. You know, he kind of knew what was happening, and uh, he wasn't afraid of what was happening. I suppose being human as we all are, your thoughts go to what about my family, and you know, when, when you are when you are the father, the grandfather, when you're the breadwinner and in that supporting role. Um, it's not so much what you, of what you're going to, it's often what you're leaving behind. But nearly knew he had a good, strong family that would look after and care for each other, so that was less of a worry in one sense. But there was just that benign, calm acceptance of, well, this is the next stage of my journey, and he, you know, he faced it well. You went down and visited um, his wife Mary on the day that he died. Yeah, yeah. you remember that obviously sure, for sure. a few different reasons. Can you just tell me your memories of that particular day? Yeah, well, I was familiar with the house and the layout of the house because I've been a few times. And uh, when I got the news that Neely had in fact passed away, I get in the car, drove down to the house, uh, and as you open the door of the living room in, in, into the house. Mary's chair was in the corner there and Mary was sitting in her chair and I just went forward to her and I got down on my knees, you know, took her hand and offered her some sympathy and we were chatting away for a wee while. Uh, and I suppose I was quite fixed on Mary when I went into the house, so I, w- I wasn't aware when I first walked through the door that the room was actually chock-a-block with people. I only saw Mary. And it took a couple of minutes of talking to Mary before I realised, wait a minute, there's other people here. And I just looked round, and there they all were. The first one I saw was Billy McNeil, and then there was Jimmy Johnson. All the Lisbon lines were there. And I don't know if my jaw dropped, but I probably did, because I suddenly went from seeing Mary to seeing all my boyhood heroes, all in the one room, all chatting away. Uh, and, of course, we were. As, as In a situation like that, we were all talking about Neely and sharing stories of his life. And Mary went upstairs and she brought down a box that had his medals and that in it. And in that box is the European Cup medal. Um, And unlike the medals of today, it's actually, you've probably seen it, it's a tiny medal, it's like a postage stamp. And she put it in my hand and I'm looking at this medal and I thought, well, I can't believe I've got this in my hand. Uh, And of course, nearly got that medal through, obviously, his connection and being on the coaching team at that time. Uh, so it was a it was a surreal moment because in any other circumstances I'd have been round all these guys getting their autographs and talking to them about Celtic, but it wasn't that kind of moment. It was just great to be in the same room and talking about Neely. And I spoke a wee bit earlier there about Neely being a family man, and I think that that's a huge connection which is not lost on Celtic. I mean, I'm not going to talk about any other team because I don't really know any other team, nor do I want to. Though I have a penchant for liking Barcelona. Barcelona is my second team. But Celtic have that family feel. If you're a Celtic fan, you belong to a family. And that's what it was like. But here were the heads of the family, if you like, all gathered in the one room. And it was a terrific moment. Um, And it, it was a good moment because everybody was talking about nearly and and of course Mary was there and although it was a a sad moment for her she would have been proud as punch to you know to have all his friends in the room and talking so fondly of him you know. Absolutely now from that particular day um, up to the the actual service and the funeral um, could you explain to me that the part that you played leading up to that and the day itself your memories of the day itself? Sure well, obviously, as I would with any family, there were, there were several meetings backwards and forwards and preparing the funeral and who was going to be doing what. Um, there's a lot of activity around here too because for a funeral of that nature, there's uh, security, there's police involvement, direct and traffic and things like that. So uh, as far as funerals go, there was a lot more preparation put into it because there were other things that we, we had to take into account. And our tradition is that the the body is received into the church the night before. So we had a little ceremony in here when we actually received Neely's body into the church. So all that was prepared to, and again, a lot of the Celtic family were here. On on the day itself, um, 
we realised that you know it was going to be standing room only in here, so we did have stewards out there making sure that the, the people the family had invited, the people that had some connection with Neely, actually managed to get in and get a seat, and it was relayed on speakers outside so, so people could actually hear what was being said. There weren't too many priests here, which surprised me, although looking back that was probably a good thing because the priests that were here were people that had some connection and that knew nearly. Um, but there were lots and lots of all, all the family were here. Anybody that had anything to do with Celtic were here. So the Lisbon Lions were here, the first team were here, the boys team were here. Let's say anybody that had, was anything to do with them were all here. Um, and some others from, from teams that he'd played with. So I did clock at the back that, that Walter Smith and Archie Knox were here. Um, and they would know nearly, well, they'd know nearly anyway, but they played in his time with, with Dundee United. So there was that actual playing connection as well. Um, Billy McNeil did one of the readings. Tommy Burns did the bidding prayers. And again... I was in heaven, you know, this, this was my paradise, if you like. Um, but it was seeing all of them, seeing them taking part in a mass I was celebrating. Um, and it was a, a celebration of Neely's life. I mean, funerals needn't be morbid or sad, and this one certainly wasn't. Although they are sad occasions too, because you're saying farewell to somebody, and, and that's never easy. Um, but we did focus on, 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 on Neely's time with us, with, with the, 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 those three words that I mentioned, his faith, his family, and his football. Um, of course, I changed the homily slightly when I saw that Walter Smith and Archie Knox were there because I, I could not miss the occasion to mention the hand in, in the sun occasion um, when Neely, in fact, scored the two goals in that great 7-1 victory. And I also mentioned the Coronation Cup, which is sometimes known as the Moken Cup because he was largely the, obviously the winner of that for them. Um, so there were there was key moments in his football career that, that were certainly mentioned in here. One thing I did say, because in going to the games when Neely was there, I used to look down on him in the dugout because I could see him quite clearly every time I went to the game. Um, and I'd mentioned the fact that when I went to Paradise, I would look down on Neely sitting in his seat. And now that Neely is in Paradise, he's in his seat looking down on the rest of us uh, and watching us as we once watched him. And that's how I kind of ended the homily that day, you know. And then obviously afterwards we went to the graveside, which again had a huge crowd and a mass of flowers, um, usually in, in the Celtic colours, but a mass of flowers. And following up, I spent some time with the family, just, you know, spent some time with them, and easing them in through that period of grief. Because when the event, you know, the funeral itself is finished, that's when people find themselves often alone with their own thoughts and their own feelings and need some support from us, which gladly I was able to give. Uh, and I've kept in touch with the family, sparingly, I have to say, since, because I'm no longer here, I've been all over the place, um, but I do keep in touch with some of the younger Mokins um, on that wonderful uh, uh, item now called Facebook. Um, social media is a great thing, and it keeps me in touch with a lot of other like-minded people as well. That was a beautiful way to describe the, the funeral service. You've mentioned previously the Celtic family being mm -hmm. part of that Celtic sure. family. How much of a loss was nearly to the actual Celtic family? I think I think Neely was a huge loss in the sense that he was. I think he was the oil in the machine. I mean, his playing career had long since passed, and a lot of people, when they retire, they retire. They go on to other things. They, they might keep an interest in in football itself, but but Neely never left that club. And he would be there to offer support and guidance and help to the, to the, the new players coming in. You know, he would, he would make sure they all had the right kit, the kit was in the right place at the right time. And um, but but more than just preparing things like he'd a, he'd a wealth of experience and knowledge and knew the game back to front, and he would knew the pitfalls. Um, 
he, he was, I mean, he was called Smiler for, for good reason, you know. He, he would make people laugh, and he always smiled himself. He was a cheery fella. Um, and I, I reckon if you, were a, if you were a new player, whether it's the youth team or the first team or whatever you've been brought in as, Neely would be a good ally to have. Um, and, and I think when Neely went, Celtic, Celtic lost more than just a former player. I mean, he scored 111 goals for them. He was no mean player, you know. He was, he was good in his time. And he never lost that. He never lost that enthusiasm for the game and that ability to, to make people at ease and to help people. Now, I'm not saying there's, there's nobody doing that now, but for all the years that Neely did that, he has made a fantastic contribution to that family. And up there with the greats, you know, that, that as someone who should, should never be forgotten, you know. The story you were telling me about your birthday, your 40th birthday. All oh, right, uh, right. If you could tell me the lead-up to that, what the plans were, sure. the problems, and then obviously sure. Graham coming up with the jersey. Well, I, I was here for three years, and I wasn't the parish priest here. I was one of the assistant priests here. And then after three years here, I became the parish priest just in a parish three miles along the road in Camelin, which in actual fact, geographically, was Neely's parish, but he came here. Um, and I was there for three years, and that coincided with my 40th birthday. And... People in Camelin, because it's just up the road and many come between the two parishes, they, they knew me well before I went there and they knew what I was like. And uh, the mass times that I had there didn't really suit when I first went um, and I knew that before I went and I already had it in my mind I was going to have to break them in gently but quickly um, to a new change in the mass times, particularly the Saturday night one which happened to be at six o'clock. And I was thinking to myself, I will not mind an extra half hour. So I changed it to half six and almost got a round of applause. And certainly they all burst out laughing because they knew, what, I didn't have to tell them why I was changing the time, they all knew. And it suited a lot of them because a lot of them also went to Parkhead and gave them more time to get back. Anyway, while I was there, it coincided with my 40th birthday party which was on a Thursday, it's the 6th of February, it was on a Thursday. And that Saturday, Celtic were due to play Wraith Rovers. And Sky Television, whom I've never forgiven for this, they moved the game from the Saturday to the Thursday. And I was in the house on Thursday morning when there was a knock on the door, and it was one of, one of my parishioners. And he said to me, what are you doing tonight, Father Brian? And I says, oh, you don't need to ask that question, you know what I'm doing tonight. He says, are you going to the game? I says, yeah, I've got my season ticket. I'll be going to the game. And then he said to me, will you not go? And I said, no, I'm going to the game. No, we don't want you to go to the game. And I says, well, unless you come up with a very good reason, I'm going to the game. And he said to me, I'll be killed for telling you this. He says, but you can't go to the game. I said, well, why can't I go to the game? And then he broke the news to me that unbeknown to me, there was a surprise birthday party in the hall that night, and obviously they wanted me there. So my plans to go to the game went out the window that night. But when I went to the, 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 the party, all my family were at the top table, and they had known for a week, and they hadn't told me anything. A previous housekeeper of mine that I had when I was in England had been up and spent a week with my mum and dad, and I didn't even know she was here. And then they brought the news to me that they had invited the first team to come. Now, I know sometimes a player or two do turn up at these things, but because of my connection here and because a lot of them knew my connection with Neely, they had agreed to come. But because of the game being changed, they were unable to come. So all during the party itself, I was wishing, gosh, I wish you hadn't told me that, you know, because that, that prayed on my mind that they could have been there. But then towards the end of the night, Graham Morrison came in and he was obviously in the youth team and from here. And Graham came up with this parcel which I unwrapped and it had a strip which I have. And Graham presented me with this which was all wrapped up. And, it's, and he told me himself it came off the back of whoever was playing number 16 that night. And I hate to say I don't know who was playing number 16 that night but there's a few famous names 
on there, some of which are legible and others, when everybody signs their signature, it's very difficult to read. Um, But there's a quiz there in itself. If anybody can work out who all of those names are, I can certainly work out some. But the burning question is, who was playing number 16 on the 6th of February, 1997? And that's the strip that they presented with me. And of course, needless to say, I would have preferred them to be there in person. But this is no second best. This is a wonderful gift to receive on your 40th birthday. Relating to Neely's funeral and events afterwards, shortly after Neely's funeral, I had a couple of friends over from Ireland and we went into Glasgow, took them to Parkhead, took them around Parkhead and then, as many people do when they're over in Glasgow, if there's a Celtic connection, they wanted to visit Baird's Bar. So I took them down to Baird's Bar and who should be behind the bar serving on that evening, as he sometimes was, was Bertie Ald. And when I walked in, Bertie recognised me and he said, Oh, Father Brian, come over. So I went over and Bertie poured us a pint of Guinness and gave us a pint of Guinness each. And for the rest of that holiday, all I got was, I can't believe we were in a bar and a Lisbon lion gave us a free pint and he knew you. And that was just one of the spin-offs of knowing Neely and having done his funeral here. We'll be right back.